end quote. Other prominent contractors bid the $75,000 job between half a million and a million dollars, reflecting the practical problems associated with Wright's ambitious and complex design. Nevertheless, the impressionistic, always ambitious Erdman seized the opportunity. He later remarked that he took the project without a bid because he felt he would give anything to work with Frank Lloyd Wright. While the opportunity propelled Erdman into the national spotlight, he struggled to complete the project. During a 1980, symp 1980 symposium at the New School in New York, Erdman recalled some of the difficulties, commenting that, and I quote again, Mr. Wright didn't want to use anything bigger than a two by four for the whole building. He wanted a very simple country church and wanted very light materials. When we built the trusses for the church, I suggested we should use two by sixes, to which he responded, what the hell do you know, baby? So we built the first truss with two by fours, but when we picked, up, picked it up with the crane, it broke in half. After this, when Mr. Wright was not around, I used two by sixes, and I took quite a beating on it." End quote. In another case, Erdman tried to add steel reinforcements to windows in the church's prow before Wright ordered them removed, and eventually they had to be reinstalled to avoid disaster. While Erdman's costs for the project are unknown, a letter from Wright to the treasurer of the First Unitarian Society shows Erdman was paid about $1,000 for his labors. Despite the professional and personal challenges of the Meeting House Commission, Erdman defended his decision to come, become involved throughout his life, stating in 1980, the church got finished and Mr. Wright ended up becoming like a father to me. I think perhaps he felt he had imposed on me a little, but I must admit I didn't mind. He told me that he would make me whatever I was to become, and he did. When we finished the church, people from all over the world called to ask if they could come see it." End quote. For Erdman, the chance to work with Wright undoubtedly helped cement his professional reputation. During the 1950s, in work he did with or without Wright, Erdman capitalized on his relationship with the famous architect as a powerful marketing tool. A feature in the Milwaukee Sentinel of 1951 focused on Erdman's low-cost houses but touted his connection with Wright, as did advertisements for the Erdman, Erdman Company through the 1950s and 60s. Erdman also seems to have been enamored with Wright's modular design method and the prairie-style aesthetic, both of which remained an integral part of his subsequent work. In the wake of the Unitarian Project, Erdman refocused his energies on home building with an eye to continuing to streamline production in keeping with trends in the building industry. In 1952, he formed a partnership with Henry Pice, a local Madison builder and cabinet maker. Erdman Pice Lumber Company operated out of the office and factory Erdman had recently built on University Avenue on Madison's far west side. Costs of lumber had gone up, raising the cost of houses. By pre-cutting wooden components at their factory, Erdman Pice was able to pass savings on to clients and home builders. A series of advertisements in the Wisconsin State Journal in early 1953 promoted the company's availability to pre-cut lumber for any house plan, as well as produce U-form cabinets of birch or mahogany. A feature celebrated the company for cutting the cost of kitchen cabinets in half through pre-cutting the pieces that the homeowner would assemble themselves. Using pre-cut pieces in standardized sizes also allowed clients to customize their kitchen cabinets and their arrangement. According to Pice, who spearheaded the U-form cabinet projects, there is no place that the amateur can go wrong if he can fit one part within a groove or bring another flush against the proper neighboring part. The U-form cabinets seem to have been a gateway for the partners. By late spring of 1953, advertisements for the cabinets included language that the same ideas could be applied to houses. One ad suggested, build your own home with pre-cut lumber, also noting that Erdman Pice is willing to give you friendly, helpful advice, too. By the fall, the firm had extended the U-form concept into furniture and complete kit houses. 
The firm hired Taliesin-trained architect Herb Fritz to design a complete line of do-it-yourself plywood furniture meant to be assembled without nails and varnished by the customer, as the Wisconsin State Journal explained, and I quote, a chair, for example, comes in four pieces, seat, back, and two sets of legs. In less than two minutes, a person can insert the legs into the seat, the back into the seat, and presto, he has a chair, end quote. The idea was to create an entire line of ready-made products by prefabricating the process as much as possible, making building of cabinets, furniture, and even houses a push-pull, click-click process. Erdman and Pice promoted the U-Format product line as a DIY effort, which resonated with the home improvement craze then sweeping the nation. In fact, they debuted the furniture and the U-Format line of houses at a weekend-long do-it-yourself show in Madison in September of 1953. The company took out a series of full-page ads in the local papers for the weekend show, which they promoted as the first of its kind in Madison. Held on the grounds of Erdman's office and factory, the show was open to multiple vendors, but clearly showcased the U-form cabinets, furniture, and dwellings. The star of the show was Erdman's do-it-yourself house. Designed by the local architectural firm Weiler & Strang, the modern three-bedroom dwelling made of pre-cut parts could be built for around $9,000, inclusive of all materials, excavating, plumbing, and electrical work. In theory, the rest of the work could be done by the homeowner. Erdman displayed the home cut in half to show the nuances of construction, a strategy builders frequently use to stage their model homes. And of course, Erdman promoted the U-form cabinets and furniture inside the dwelling itself. Life magazine featured the house in an article in October of 1953, noting that Erdman's pre-cut houses were neither the first nor the cheapest kit. The Life editors boldly asserted that they were probably the best designed. For the next several years, Erdman focused his attention on the U-format houses. Several months after the Life article, Erdman announced the firm would construct a $250,000 addition to the factory specifically to cut parts for the pre-cut houses. Ads for U-format houses, as seen in life, flooded local and regional papers. Despite the original plan to build the U-form houses in a 400-mile radius of the factory, the effort was concentrated in Madison. Madison was Erdman's laboratory for testing the market for pre-cut houses, as well as where he could experiment with working methods pre-cutting component parts, and assembling these into a kit that could be erected on site by the homeowner. His broad promotional effort in local newspapers, magazines, and parade of home shows was typical of the way in which merchant builders across the nation grew their businesses. It is in this context that Erdman took the next step into more complete prefabrication, which led to the experiment with Wright, which I talked about at the beginning of this lecture. UW-Milwaukee architectural historian Paul Sprague has attributed the genesis of the Erdman Wright prefabs to a chance stop Erdman made at Wright's Madison office to use the phone sometime in 1954. When Erdman saw, I'm sorry, excuse me, when Wright saw Erdman's designs for the U-format dwellings, he told him he could design a much better house. By February of 1956, the pair had decided to go forward with construction of the first model, the one featured in House and Home. The plan was derived from 16-inch modular units. Walls were built of 8 by 8 foot stressed skin modular panels with redwood battens on the exterior and mahogany battens on the interior. Panels were prefabricated at Erdman's Madison factory and shipped to the building site extending Erdman's working method beyond pre-cutting components into more complete prefabrication. News articles from around the country hailed the first prefabricated house as an aesthetic breakthrough in prefab housing, bringing together Wright's world-renowned design and aesthetic with the latest trends in the building industry. Wright designed two more model prefabs for Erdman, although only one of these two was built, this model, like the first, being completed in Madison. 
The two-story dwelling was based on Wright's conception of the one-room house. The entire house was designed on a two-foot module. The two-story window walls show this well with a series of two-foot by four-foot windows. Like the first model house, the second prefab received plenty of attention in the national media, but it also had meaning in a local context. Mary Ellen Rudin, one of the original homeowners, explained to me in a 2011 interview how she and her husband Walter came to purchase the house when they were both young UW mathematics professors. Erdman took them to see it after it did not sell during the 1959 Parade of Homes, marketing it to the young couple as an economical way to own a house designed by the master, Frank Lloyd Wright. Rudin explained that Erdman also sold them add-ons in the form of Wright-designed furniture, several pieces of which they, they purchased to furnish the house. A Madison-based experiment in prefab design, the Rudins made the house their home for 51 years. Despite an outpouring of national press attention, the Erdman-Wright prefabs never achieved widespread success. Some of this was due to their relatively high cost, tied to the complexity of Wright's designs, and significant site work. In fact, prefab model one was estimated to cost between forty dollars and $50,000, depending upon options, and siting and, siting, uh, and materials of prefab two could cost anywhere from thirty-eight dollars to $45,000. Yet this experiment largely confined the two Madison models, and several examples in the region and a few isolated examples elsewhere proved formative on Erdman's other major endeavor in the late 1950s, the prefabricated medical buildings. Erdman's target clientele gradually shifted toward the medical profession in the mid-1950s, a time when the housing market was slowing and builders were changing up their practices. In Erdman's case, the idea to specialize in medical buildings grew out of a failed attempt to build a 60-unit apartment complex adjacent to the Unitarian Meeting House in Shorewood Hills. The Farley Land Company, for which Erdman was vice president, wanted to build a series of 15 four-unit apartment buildings arranged in a U-shaped configuration. The village board killed the project in April of 1950 refusing to rezone the land to allow for multifamily units. A year later, the development team announced an alternative, a doctor's office building to help solve an acute shortage of medical office space in Madison. Drawn by local architect William Kayser, the plan called for construction of a two-story L-shaped medical building of red brick and glass to house up to 60 doctors in 30 offices, each with a waiting room and several consultation rooms. The building would also include a gymnasium for employees, a pharmacy, and a nursery. Parking was located between the arms of the L-shaped structure. This proposal sailed through rezoning without controversy in early 1952, but ultimately did not come to pass. Erdman later described the scheme as an expensive failure. $10,000 went into a design that Erdman realized no one wanted. The Wisconsin State Journal reported that, quote, doctors, it seems, are highly individualistic. Their requirements vary. One wants to own and another wants to rent. They have different ideas of space layout. Many want a separate building with their own sign in front, end quote. So instead of the large medical building, Erdman erected the first doctor's park in 1955, taking advantage of the more permissive zoning to construct a series of 10 to 12 small buildings, each designed for and privately owned or occupied by a small cadre of partner doctors. The individual offices were modeled after a medical building Erdman had constructed for two dentists at the northwestern corner of the intersection of Glenway and Monroe Streets in the West Lawn neighborhood in 1954. William Kayser, who had designed the plan for the medical arts facility, developed models after this example for three different kinds of offices at Doctors Park to accommodate between one and three doctors. Each building stood on a roughly half-acre parcel of land, allowing for parking for several cars and surrounded by ample landscaping. 
Thus, the scheme mirrored the residential setting of suburban neighborhoods on Madison's west side. The offices visually blended with the nearby single-family dwellings and yet offered a commercial service, medical care, for suburban residents. Erdman applied thinking from his U-format dwellings to the medical buildings, using modular planning and prefabricated components. Essentially, the buildings employed a plug-and-play system by which doctors customized their offices around their individual needs. As Erdman explained in a 1957 article in the Milwaukee Journal, the basic unit was a 28 by 48 foot structure of prefabricated parts assembled at the Madison factory. It contained a waiting room, reception room, four exam rooms, and laboratory utility spaces. The article touted that flexibility of size is one of the features. Additional rooms can be added in pairs to the end of the structure, or side-by-side -side duplex models are available, as well as an L-shaped plan. Moreover, doctors could choose redwood, cedar, or composition siding, or masonry for an additional cost, as well as purchase Erdman's prefabricated cabinetry. As important as the flexible design scheme was to the success of individual medical buildings, Erdman's conception of siting these buildings in a park was arguably more vital for their ultimate popularity. Moving the buildings to the suburbs took the practice of medicine out of downtown hospitals, which meant medicine was more accessible to suburban patients, something doctors appreciated about the parks. The location of individual officers in a offices in a clustered setting meant that doctors could consult with or send patients to specialists as needed, like a hospital but without the problems of a downtown location, specifically parking. According to Erdman, and I quote, for a group of doctors interested in maintaining independent practices and yet remaining in close touch with other doctors who are specialists in others' fields, doctors' parks are the answer, end quote. And we can perhaps talk about that uh, individualism uh, a bit later in the Q&A. Doctors' Parks, which the Wisconsin State Journal called shopping centers for medicine, also satisfied an auto-oriented middle-class culture. Built in suburban locations where inexpensive land was plentiful, the medical offices were surrounded by ample parking, which won the patronage of suburban middle-class residents. In a 1964 article for the Physician's Management Journal on the medical buildings, Erdman wrote, adequate parking for a doctor's office is as important as an efficiently planned medical building. Erdman went on to argue that one couldn't isolate consideration of a building from parking, that they should be thought of as one entity. Erdman again, generous parking is not a luxury, it is a necessity. The first doctor's park in Madison also included a drive-in pharmacy, perhaps the first in the nation. It opened to great fanfare on June 16, 1958. Erdman's logic in locating a pharmacy in the park was tied to his conception of it as a medical community. As Erdman explained, a doctor could easily call the prescription over to the pharmacy such that the patient could pick it up on their way home. This conception of doctors' parks as communities of individuals resonates with the post-war suburban context in which these parks were located. Erdman consciously designed his buildings and their landscaping to echo the middle-class suburban domestic landscape. Part of this was to provide pleasant surroundings in which to work, but there were other tactical advantages that Erdman undoubtedly recognized. The fact that the buildings looked like mini houses allowed them to blend such that they would easily be allowed by exception in R1 residential zoning. For Erdman, doctor's parks were part and parcel of post-war suburbia. As he opined in physician's management, and I quote again, a doctor's park provides the answer to ever-increasing problems of downtown traffic congestion and lack of access and parking and takes the practice of medicine to residential areas where the greatest number of patients can be served." End quote. This made sense to Erdman. Patients were in the suburbs, so removing the parks to this area was logical, even if he had to initially convince doctors and to an extent patients of this logic. To do so meant launching a publicity campaign of sorts. 
Much as he did with the U-format houses, Erdman sought out any and every opportunity to sell the concept of the doctor's parks. He advertised in trade journals like Physicians Management. His buildings appeared in feature articles in the New York Times, and he advertised in the Wall Street Journal. Erdman also maintained an extensive file of testimonials from doctors for whom he had built his buildings, which he sent to prospective clients across the country upon request. In 1986, the company boasted they had a list of 22,000 physicians who practiced in one of more than 2,000 Erdman medical buildings across the country. Prefabricated panels were initially made in the Madison factory. Subsequently, the firm established offices in New Jersey, Dallas, Atlanta, and elsewhere. Erdman's business had grown from one builder's small operation in Madison in the late 1940s to generate $100 million in sales annually by 1986. And while Erdman's path compared with other merchant builders in moving from local to national markets, his specialization in medical buildings appears to be unique. Erdman was the pioneer of this building type and arguably the premier builder in the country. In pioneering the concept, moreover, he essentially suburbanized medical practice on a nationwide scale. Although buildings within these doctor's parks made use of prefabrication, Erdman never intended the medical buildings to be cookie cutter products. Each was customized for the site in question, and Erdman and his staff worked closely to meet the individual needs of each and every client. For Erdman, prefabrication was a tool that allowed him to meet the needs of an expanding suburban market in a more efficient manner, something he learned partly from his work with Wright on the prefab model houses. But while Erdman was indebted to Wright, he also learned much from the city in which he worked. A demanding market in Madison, a demanding housing market in Madison, immediately after World War II, prompted Erdman to sell his first house and set him on a course toward mass production. Madison embraced the u format experiment with Pice that led Erdman to collaborate with Wright on the prefab model houses. And finally, Madison was the location where Erdman developed the prefabricated medical buildings, which would shape medical practice across the United States in the late 20th century. As his career entered its twilight in the early 1990s, Erdman worked closely with world-renowned architect, planner, and founder of the Congress of the New Urbanism, Andres Duwani, to develop a 153-acre site about eight miles west of downtown Madison. Middleton Hills was Erdman's most comprehensive venture to date, a master-planned neo-traditional neighborhood development with a commercial town center and a variety of dwelling types on small lots surrounded by community-oriented green spaces. Following principles of the new urbanist movement that espoused a return to early 20th century architectural styles rooted in region, dwelling units in Middleton Hills loosely followed one of three styles found throughout Madison in the early 20th century, arts and crafts bungalow, and not surprisingly, the prairie style. Like other projects throughout his career, Erdman wanted Middleton Hills to be pathbreaking. And yet, as he told the Capital Times, this project was different and it was special. This will be my swan, swan song, he stated. I believe in it. I want this to be my contribution to the community. I want to do something worthwhile. After more than a year of negotiating zoning and permits, Middleton Hills received final approval in September of 1994, fulfilling Erdman's wish to give back to the community that had nurtured so many of his pioneering experiments. I end this lecture by looking more closely at the landscape of Erdman's swan song. The use of the prairie style supports the new urbanist commitment to region while honoring Wright's legacy. Today, the development plays tribute to the local by preserving a sizable uh, wetland area and at the Prairie Cafe, which boasts of the right burger with a W. Then there's the street names, which pay homage to the landscape, such as Glacier Ridge Road, and notable figures with connections to Wisconsin, such as John Muir, Aldo Leopold, and Gaylord Nelson, and of course, Wright himself. 
Undoubtedly, Erdman viewed Wright as a kind of father figure, and as I've shown, made much of their relationship across his career. And yet there's so much more to the story than Erdman's reverence for the world-famous architect. And you might take a moment to consider here who's on top. <laughs> At Middleton Hills, Erdman paid homage to his home, the place where he entered the building industry, transformed the field of prefabricated construction, became the nation's leading producer of medical buildings, and revolutionized production of office furniture in this country. Middleton Hills is, as Erdman wanted, a swan song, but not just as a cap to a productive building career. Rather, I see it as a tribute to his home for five decades, and it echoes the theme of my talk today, that understanding Erdman's building career demands we attend to the ways in which his buildings were Madison made. Thank you so much. And just a, a note of special thanks to Dan Erdman and the Erdman Archives, uh, and as well to the biography uh, from which I drew much of the biographical details today. Great. So uh, my colleague and I will walk around uh, the mic with, uh, for questions, so. Thank you, Anna. Um, one of the things uh, Marshall did halfway through his career started in an art department because he was tired of doctors' wives finishing off the buildings. And he would loan art mm -hmm. that mostly was accepted, and it was a beautiful way to finish off buildings. But you made no mention of that. I kind of viewed that as an innovation that you know, was part of the Erdman legacy of you know, really finishing these buildings off uh, in an extraordinary way. Uh, how do you view that? It was in the Mo D'Alessio book yes. uh, about the art department. Sure. Thanks, Steve. Um, so the, the question, which uh, I just want to repeat, is about uh, sort of the art department that he created to finish uh, the medical buildings. So what I was focusing on today was largely uh, Erdman's career in the 50s and 60s up to the time that the prefabricated skin of the buildings was getting, getting uh, built. That's the period of my research, and that's largely what I focus on in my own work on Erdman. But undoubtedly, the fact that he did have an art department to furnish the buildings was sort of part of the design build you know, from start to finish, all scales of this thing. And so interiors are undoubtedly uh, an important part of Erdman's career, particularly later on um, when you know, the, the, the experiments in the prefabricated buildings themselves uh, was sort of solidified. I don't know if that answers your question, but thanks. Thanks. In, the, uh, in your talk, you bring up Middleton Hills and Andres Duaney. And um, back then, I was in a co-housing group that was looking for a place to settle. And we mm -hmm. thought of the future Middleton Hills as a possibility. And I remember taking part in a charrette, which was a brand new concept <laughs> to me. Um, and I think it was Duaney and his group that brought that in. Can you talk about would Erdman have been involved in that? And, and what was his attraction to working with, with that other group? Yeah, this is, this is a great question. And you're absolutely correct. Um, Duaney, his firm, uh, Duaney Plater Zyberg, um, DPZ as it's known, and Erdman did hold charrettes to specifically work on designing different aspects of that community. I don't know if that was 93 or 94. What I can speak to, and I was not in Madison at that point, um, what I can speak to is your, the second part of your question, which really was where he got this idea. Um, again, this falls outside sort of the focus of my research on the immediate post-World War II period, but what I see with that um, is Erdman's persistent desire to be at the forefront, to find the latest things. And he found out about new urbanism. It was in the news somewhat, certainly in architectural and building circles, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, when the Congress of the New Urbanism was being formed. Seaside, the first uh, new urbanist community in Florida, was in the news at the time. And Erdman always wanted to be uh, at the cutting edge of the building industry. And I liken his interest in new urbanism in the early 90s very much to the do-it-yourself show that I talked about today. 
Um, Do It Yourself was a movement that really was galvanized in the early 1950s um, as a way to build yourself. Contractors were in short supply, builders were in short supply. And so Erdman heard about this. He saw that there were do-it-yourself shows elsewhere, including famous ones in 1953, the same year he staged the one in Madison. There was one in New York and one in Chicago. And he got right on it. He did it. And I think that's the same as what you see with Middleton Hills and his interest in new urbanism. Professor Andrew Jeffsky, thank you so much for this fascinating talk and, and also the great book that you're writing on in, on Florida, which I find fascinating. I have um, two questions. One is uh, early in your talk, you mentioned Joyce Erdman doing design work, you know, and I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about her contributions. Um, the second is, have you ever been able to interview someone who uh, built one of these homes and like what their experience was with the the kit, was it really so easy, for example? And then finally, I noticed in passing on the screen um, a mention in one of the advertisements, a connection to Beloit College, and if, you, if there's anything you could say about that. It looked like there was a partnership with Beloit College. Yeah, I'll have to, I can't answer that last question. Um, Joyce's, invo it's, Joyce's involvement um, in design of the houses seems to be early on. Um, for the most part, and that makes sense. She had a, a, a growing family um, and sort of fell out of it. I, 